Welcome everyone to your third session. Today we're going to do question and answers based on study unit four. Um, and I've shared with you the weekly session plans. You must please follow that uh, because it's paced in a way that it should help you understand and unpack the the material and be able to follow so that you don't fall behind uh, to help you submit your assignments on time as well. And I've 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 pasted them in a way that it should help us um, that we finish with the content a week before this assignment closes so that then it gives you more time if you still want to work on your assignments as well. You can still work on after our last session to make sure that you submit on time. With assignment one, remember you will get your third submission right at the end of a week before the closing date. They will give you a, a third submission and this is based on mainly because we started e-tutorials late, but this will not be for all the assignment. It might be, but it might not be for all the assignment. It's only for assignment one and that is the reason why I'm saying and because we realized that also many people submitted their assignment one submission one and two um, one after the other so we are allowing you to have a third submission because now we relate the message to you to say pace yourself don't do submission one and two at the same time allow time in between uh, for the both of those two submissions. So now you should be able to do that. OK, so let's continue with today's session, which is question and answers for study unit four, which is basic probabilities. I've also asked you to go through the content because I post the content before a recordings of the content before so that you are able to go through the two hour session or the one hour session of content so that when we come and do the question and answer session, we concentrate on how to answer the question to relating to that content that you went through on your own. Right. So I'm going to do a quick summary, uh, hoping that by half past I should be done with the quick summary and then we will start with the question and answer. If there is something that you don't understand, please stop me. Don't raise your hand because I'm not, uh, I, I can't see my uh, chat function. Uh, please unmute and let me know that you have a question to ask before I continue and carry on. Don't just write on the chat. If there is a question on the chat, somebody just alert me to that as well. Okay, so when we talk about probabilities, we're talking about chances. We're talking about the likelihood of something happening. Um, so a probability is a chance that a uncertain event uh, will occur, and that can always be between the values of zero and one. An impossible event is an event that cannot happen, or it will, it does not have any chance of happening, and that will always have a probability of zero. And a certain event is an event that we know for sure that it will happen and it will always have a probability of one. In terms of assessing probabilities as well, there are three approaches and usually we use the approach um, a priori and empirical probabilities when we work with basic probabilities. We don't use the subjective probabilities. You can go and study what all three of them do. But a priori is based on the prior knowledge of the process. So if, for example, you're creating an event, an event is like tossing a coin, and when a coin lands on a head, I should be able to calculate the probability of a coin landing on a head. And that is <clears throat> based on the fact that I know that a coin has a head and a tail, and it's a 50-50 chance that it will land on a a head and that we calculated by using your x divided by t where x is the outcome that you uh, uh, 
are getting from that event that you created and your T is your sample space or your grand total or your total number of outcomes, all of them combined, that will give you your T. And also with empirical probabilities, it also uses your prior knowledge, but that will also, you will also uh, calculate it the same way and that will be the number of ways the event can happen, which are your outcomes, divide by the grand total or the sample space or the number, the total number of outcomes that you have. And a subjective one is based on a researcher's um, uh, own opinion. So you can uh, have your own opinion in terms of um, that it might be 70% of a chance that uh, the sun will come out or it's going to be raining and all that. And those are subjective to the researchers as well. Um, I've already alluded to an event and we know that an event happens when you create an event. It's like when you're tossing a coin or you uh, pulling a cut or rolling a die or the sun coming up. That is an event uh, and an event has possible outcomes that can happen. Uh, so when I roll a die, a die has six sides. So it can either land on a one or a two or a three or four or five or six. Those are outcomes. So when I do one thing, when I do one event, it is what we call a simple event. Rolling a die is a simple event. When I do two things, rolling a die and tossing a coin, I am creating two events and those are called joint events. An uh, event that happens and they've got two or more characteristics that will occur. And when I roll a die and I toss a coin, and if it lands on a head and a die lands on a six, I'm creating two joint events for that event that I am creating. And a complement is an event that does not include the others. For example, with a coin, it has two sides. A head is a complement of a tail, a tail is a complement of a head. In case of a die, one is a complement of all the other sides of a die. A six is a complement of all other sides of a die. And that's how you will read your complement event. So if I say um, I roll a die and a die lands on a one, what is a complement of a one? It will be all the other events. Uh, a die uh, landing on a two, three, four, five, and a six. Those are complement of a one. A sample space is a collection of all events or all outcomes. So when you create an event, an event is created from this one thing that has outcomes. And those outcomes, if I combine all of them, they create what we call a sample space. So a sample space, we use that to create an event. And within that event, it will come out with an outcome like a die. It's a sample space because all the sides of a die creates a sample space. It creates a grand total, the total of all sides. And similar to a 52 cut of a uh, cut, a deck of a cut, um, it's a sample space. If I draw a cut, I'm creating an event and the outcome can either be an ace of spade, an ace of a diamond, and an ace of a heart or a club, things like that. Those are my outcomes. Okay. We can visualize probabilities and events in terms of different things. We can use a Venn diagram and a Venn diagram. We can demonstrate simple event like the green cycle is a simple event of A. Um, if A re uh, represent aces, so this, those will be the cards that has an ace on it and B representing the cards that are red and that will be that. So we know that in a sample space, which is a collection of all the cuts, there are cuts that are red, there are cuts that are black, there are cut, there is a cut that is an ace, and an ace can be red or black, and it's black when it's a club or a spade, and it's red when it is a heart or a diamond. So in between where they both share, because let A representing aces and B representing red card. Therefore, the ace of a 
diamond and an ace of a heart, they are joint event or joint outcomes from ace and red, and that creates a joint event as well. And that we're going to discuss uh, the uh, joint event and the union events, which are your AOB events. We will get to that just now. We can also visualize events using a contingency table. And this is the most easy table to use. If you are able to create this table, you should be able to represent your event or your probabilities with this table and be able to answer questions. And you will see that the majority of questions are based on a contingency table. And if there is no contingency table, we are going to create one to enable us to answer some of the questions. And you can also create your or visualize your events based on a decision tree, which also gives you the outcomes <clears throat> as well. I'm not going to explain more about this because in that video that I'm explaining, um, uh, I have told you about, I said you can go and listen to that or watch that. It explains the type of events and what we see in, in those table in detail. Simple event and joint probabilities, we calculate them by using the outcome satisfying the event divided by the grand total for a simple event. So if I want to calculate the simple event like probability of a king, I will use outcome satisfying a king divided by the sample space, which will be the total of the deck, which is 52. Um, and uh, because there are four kings in the deck, so there will be four divided by 52, and that will give you your probability. A joint event will be if I want to draw a cut that is a king and a spade. Um, so I'm creating two events at that point, and that will be if, um, uh, the number of outcomes satisfying that event, which is a king and a spade. There is only one cut that is a king and a spade. Um, and divide by the grand total or the sample space, which will be 52 of them. So it will be one divided by 52 when I, I use the joint event. And that is how you will calculate the probabilities. The always the probabilities is going to be the probability of an event. Let's use A, event A. Will be the number satisfying divided by the sample space, even if it's a joint event, event A and B. You will re realize that here yeah, I'm using and, you can use and, and you can use intersect as well. They mean one and the same thing. And that will be observation satisfying that event, the joint event, divided by the grand total. We're going to use that to calculate probabilities. There are also what we call mutually exclusive events, and those are events that will not happen or cannot happen at the same time. And usually these are joint events. So the probability of finding the mutually exclusive events, event A and B, if they are mutually exclusive, the probability will be equals to zero because that is an impossible event that will happen. We also have what we call collectively exhaustive events, which means all events need to satisfy the sample space. So if I have event A, which is representing aces, and B representing black cards, and C representing diamonds, and D representing wind, oh sorry, hearts, event A, B, C, and D will represent a, it's a collectively exhaustive um, uh, events because all of them make up the sample space, but they are not mutually exclusive. An ace may be also of a hat. Um, so a event A and D will not be mutually, ex uh, mutually, or they, they will not be mutually exclusive because we can have a cut that is an ace and a cut that is um, an ace uh, with a hat. And even B, C, and D are collectively exhaustive. 
and are also mutually exclusive because uh, a cat cannot be a heart and a black, or it can also not be a diamond cut. Okay. Um, this is how you represent joint events and simple events. So inside the contingency table, those will be your joint events and you can calculate your probability uh, of a joint event there and the grand totals outside or the totals outside that's where you can calculate your simple events and your joint events create what we call marginal probabilities or marginal events that we can use to calculate a simple event because if i add this uh, probability of a1 and b1 and probability of a1 and b2 will give me the probability of a and we know that the probability of a is a simple event a1 it's a simple event what we also need to realize is the sum of all probabilities should also be equals to zero so if i add everything that is inside the joint probabilities all these four quadrants they should give me one or if i add the total whether i add from the row uh, b1 probability of b1 plus probability of b2 should give me one or probability of um, A1 and probability of A2 should give me one as well. In a nutshell, what I've just said was that uh, probability is the likelihood of something happening. The probability should be between zero and one. Therefore, it means the sum of all probabilities as well, that is what we just did now, should be equals to one. And that also states that if it's equals to one, if I need to find the probability of A, therefore it means to find in the probability of A, we'll have the complement, which is one minus the probability of B, one minus the probability of B. I just need to write it correctly. minus the probability of B plus the probability of C and that will give me a complement event. <clears throat> we also you need to be aware of the following. There is what we call an addition rule but normally they will not tell you that in the exam or in your assignment that apply the addition rule. You need to just know that this is part of the addition rule. So if we need to find the probability of an event A or event B, not both of them, but either one of them happening, that will be given by the probability of A plus the probability of B minus the probability of A and B. And that is how you will find the probability of A or B happening. But if and only if the, prob uh, the event A and B are mutually exclusive, if they are mutually exclusive, then the probability of A and B will be equals to zero because that is an impossible event. So the probability of finding A or B will be just given by the probability of A plus the probability of B. Right. Only, only if they are mutually exclusive. Otherwise, this is the general formula that we're going to be using. The probability of A or B will be given by the probability of A plus the probability of B minus the probability of A and B. We also have conditional probabilities. That is the probability of A happening given that B has already happened. The probability that event A is happening, given that event B has already happened. The key word here is the given part. And that is given by the probability of A and B divided by the probability of the given event, which is the B. So the, prob the conditional probability of probability of A given B, it's given by the joint probability of A and B divided by the given probability, which is the probability of B and vice versa. 
the probability of B given A, it's also the same as the probability of A and B divided by the probability of A. And this probability of A and B, it is not the probability of A and the probability of B. This are not the same. This is a joint probability, it's one value. So if they give you the probability of A and they say the probability of A is 0 0.5 and they give you the probability of B, which is 0 0.6, and they ask you to find the probability of A and B, never ever ever say that probability of A and B is that plus that. They are not the same. These two are three different probabilities, simple probability, simple probability and joint probability. Always remember that. Okay, so if and only if we are given, or not if and only if, if we are given the probability of a conditional probability, let's say we are given the probability of A given B, and we are given the probability of B, and they ask us to find the probability of a joint event. If they're asking us, find the probability of A and, and B, if that is the question, but they have given us the conditional probability, then we're going to apply what we call a multiplication rule, oh sorry, multiplication rule, which state that the probability of A and B is equals to the probability of A given B times the probability of B. Now, Remember, I told you in the beginning, the probability of A is given by X divided by N, and I said the probability of A and B is given by observation satisfying the joint event divided by N. Only if you are given the conditional probabilities, then you can find the probability of A and B by using the conditional probability times the probability of B. And that is, if they haven't given you the conditional probability, therefore, we use the probability of A and B as observation satisfying the joint event divided by N. Right. If and only if A and B are independent, if they tell you that they are independent or you can see that they are independent, then the conditional probability of A given B will be the same as the probability of A and the probability of A. Conditional probability of B given A will be the same as the probability of B because the given event has no bearing on what happens to the probability that you are looking for. They are independent, so they do not influence one another. Only and only if the event A and B are independent. Now, you can also use this to prove if event A and B are independent, because if I prove that event A and B are independent, therefore it means the conditional probability of A given B should be the same as the probability of a simple event probability of A. If they are not equal, then they are not independent. If and only if event A and B are independent, then the joint probability of A and B is given by the probability of A times the probability of B, and that is multiplication rule. Only if and only if the event A and event B are mutually exclusive, then the probability of a joint event A and B for conditional probabilities is given by the probability of A times the probability of B because we know that the conditional probability of A given B is the same as the probability of A. And that is that you need to know about the rules. Now, there are additional other things that you need to know when you work with probabilities. And one of those things are the counting rules. So we 
with counting rules, we want to know the number of outcomes, possible outcomes that can happen. Number of ways certain things can be done. So if one of the K different mutually exclusive and collectively exhaustive events can occur on each of the trials, the number of possible outcomes will equal to K to the power of N. Let's say you are running in a race. In a race, there are seven positions that will get a price. What will be the number of ways that you will get a price? And that um, uh, if in the race, seven position and only three of you will get a price. And that will be seven to the power of three. That will give you that. If you roll a fair die, and we know that a fair die has an outcome of six uh, outcomes, and if I roll that die three times, how many possible ways I will have the die land on any combination? And that will be your six is your outcome trials. There are six of them, so it will be six K, uh, sorry, K is your outcomes that are one of them should be mutually exclusive and collectively exhaustive. So there are six sides and the number of trials are the number of times you roll that die and you're doing it three times that will represent your N. So it will be six to the power of three and that will give you. Your outcome that is the counting rule. The other rule. It's a multiplication rule. It states that if there are K1 event in, of the first trial and K2 event of the second trial and up to the other KN event on the nth trial, what will be the number of possible outcomes that can happen? And that will be given by the multiplication of all their trials. K1 times K2 times K3 times K4 up until Kn. If I have to go to a park, eat a rest at, at a restaurant, see a movie, and there are three parks, four restaurants, six movies, how many different ways or different combination I can do in order to do all this? Go to a park, eat at a restaurant, and see a movie. Because there are three Restaurant four, uh, three packs, four restaurants, six movies. So it will be a multiplication of each trial. Three times four times six. That will give me the different ways I can go and visit all three of them or do all three events. And that is multiplication rule. The next one is what we call a factorial. The number of ways an item can be arranged or placed in an order. And how many number of ways I can take out the book from a library. If there are four books that I need to take out. Then I can take out four books or three books, two books, one book at a time. That is your N factorial, meaning I can take four times three times two times one. That is your N factorial. On your calculators, um, factorials, uh, the other side didn't tell you where to find them because you always use them. So this is the power. You know how to find the power, right? On your calculator, you do have a function. Some calculator has an N factorial, some calculator has an X factorial. And that is the uh, function you're going to use on your calculator to calculate n factorial. So let's say you want to calculate five factorial. So that will be five, and then you press the n um, n factorial button on your calculator, and then just press the equal sign. You will see that you will get 120, and that's how you will calculate the number of ways uh, you can take out a book from a library. So if here yeah, I need to place five books on a bookshelf. How many number of ways I can do that? I can do it four times um, five times four times three times two times one. And that is 120 ways. 
The last one, oh, not the last one, the second last one is what we call a permutation. And with permutation, it also tells me how many number of ways I can arrange certain things or do certain things if order is a priority or there is an order in how I do things or there is a preference in how I do things. You have five books and you are going to put them on the three shelves. How many ways they can be ordered on the shelf? So they also tell me that I need to put them on the three shelves. So those are the order. So you will realize that we do have permutation and then we also have a combination. So with permutation, always remember that there will be order and preference given. How many number of ways can you, can the uh, books be ordered on the bookshelf? So they're giving me an order in terms of how I must place the books. So how can I order them on the there? So there is an order on this. So it means I need to do a permutation. On your calculators, I've shown you how to do uh, factorials, but now I want to say you can use permutation on your calculator. Go and look for NPR or NPX on your calculators, depending. So those who are using a case here, uh, probably it is on. You must look for it. It is on a multiplication uh, function. Those who are using a sharp calculator, it will be on a number six button. So how do we calculate NPR on your calculator? And in terms of in terms of formula, you just use your five as your N and your X is your three, the smallest value is always your X. So how do we arrange these books? Five factorial divided by five minus three factorial, which will be 120 divided by two, which is six on your calculator. You can press five and press the button that relates to the number, which will be second function because it's written in orange or shift depending on your calculator, shift or second function, and then press your NPR button, and then press three and press equal and, and see if you get the same answer. You should get 60. If you're not getting 60, let me know. And that is permutation with order. Combination, same as permutation without order, If you have to arrange five books are going to be selected to read or you are going to or you have five books and are going to select three to read, how many different combinations are you going to uh, read those books, ignoring the order in which they are being selected? So now order is not important. We use combination. Also similar. The bigger the number is your N, so five is your N and X is your three. And you just substitute into the formula. Five factorial, uh, three factorial times five minus three factorial, and that will give you 10. On your calculator also, look for NCR. Usually it's next to your, your permutation. It's also written as NCR. And on your Casio, it will be on a division. On a sharp calculator, it will be on button number five. And that you do the same. You say five and you will press second function or NC uh, or shift or shift. And then you will press and see our button that corresponds to that and press three and then press equal and you should get the answer of 10. If there is no order, there is 10 ways you can do things. And if there is order, 
there are 60 ways you can do the same thing. And those are the counting rules and those are the summary for study unit four that you need to know and learn. Are there any questions before we start answering questions? I know that my summary was long, but I needed to do that revision so that we are all on the same page when it comes to doing activities. Hi, Lizzie. Hi, Lizzie. So yes. I missed the first few sessions, sessions mm -hmm. but my, my time calculator, 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 uh, what, uh, what did you set, set up in terms, terms of mode? mode. So I think one to one the power of 10, 10 um, um, I think six to the power of 10 for the previous answer. So obviously it's quite logical, but once we get to more difficult questions, um, I think I'm on the wrong setting. Okay, you still, your, your case sure is still set on state mode. Um, it, it gives me a lot of options for the stat mode. OK, so press mode and yeah. then press one. For okay. COMP. OK, and it should have met at the top. OK, and no, then that's it, simple. That's fine. Yeah. All right. Thank you. Thank you. All right. So let's. If there are no questions, or let me check. Are there any questions on the chat? I'm unable to use my microphone. OK. All right, so there are no questions there, so let's do exercises. Exercise one, table one below shows fake news media and the type of personality the postings were about. Which one of the following statement is incorrect? So they give us table 1.1, which has social media and traditional media and celebrity, politician and superstar. And joint event, celebrity and social media, there are 1,800. Simple event, celebrity, there are 2,285 now. When when you get a contingency table and you get whole numbers like this, then know that these are events. Events, whole numbers. Probabilities, there will be decimals decimals or percentages. If you get a table and it has decimals and percentages and those decimals are like zero point uh, are between zero and one, zero and one, or they are between zero percent and hundred percent, then you know that these are probabilities. If it's whole numbers, then you know that there are events. So we're going to apply the formulas for the events. So now, number one, it says, and we know that the sample space here is 4,000. Number one says, uh, we need to select which one of the statement is incorrect, but because we are evaluating all of them, it's fine. So number one says, find the probability of a joint event C and SS. So C is this, SS is that. Find the probability of joint event C and SS. Remember, the joint probability, we can find it event satisfying the event the joint probability divided by the sample space is event c and ss can we find the joint event of those two that is your question are we able to find the joint event like, for example, a joint event celebrity and SM is 1,800. Is celebrity and super 
superstar? Can we find joint events? No, it's an impossible event because they are from the same variable, the same category. So any a person uh, in this instance is cannot be a celebrity and be a superstar. They are mutually exclusive. So this is correct because they are mutually exclusive. What about the probability of C and SM? C and SM, the event X and the grand total. So calculate the probability of C and SM. So that will be given by 1,800 divided by 4,000. And what is that probability? It is not 0.45. Not 0.45. Okay. So therefore that is also correct. The probability of C and TM. C and TM. It's where they both join. So that is. 485 divided by 4,000. Which is not 0.12. Not 0.12, which is correct. The probability, so yeah, we need to find the probability of SM given that C has already happened. So we are asked to find the probability of SM given that C has already happened, and we know that is given by the probability of a joint event of both of them. So I'm going to do both of them, S and C, S, M and C, divide by the probability of a given, which is C. So what is the joint probability of S, M and C? S, M and C, is 1,800. Remember always, divide by the grand total, which is 4,000. Divide by the probability of C. C is A. That is our X. So that will be 2,285 divide by 4,000. And then here we apply maths, right? Which is 1,800 divided by 4,000. Multiply, we change the sign, we change the division sign to a multiplication, and we flip the second fraction. What is at the top goes to the bottom. What is at the bottom comes to the top. And therefore, 4,000 and 4,000 cancels out, and we are left with 1,800 divided by 2285. And what is the answer? No 0.787, so no 0.79. That is not 0.79. Therefore, that is not correct. We can also do the same with the second one. Let's do the second one. The second one, or the last one, says we need to find the probability of SM given SS. The probability of social media given that the person is a superstar which will be given by the probability of a joint event, probability of joint event SM and SS divided by the probability of SS, which is the joint event of SS and SM is 
0.515 divide by 4,000 divide by the probability of a simple event SS. Simple event SS <laughs> is 6. 665 divided by 4,000. And we can do the same. Okay. So if I flip and change the whole equation, 4,000 and 4,000 will cancel out, and I will be left with 515. 515 divided by 6, 665, which is equals to, so you apply the same method as I did here, which is equals to, what is 515 divided by 665? 0 0.774, so round down to 0 0.77. 0 0.77, which is that and that's how you will evaluate the statement and find the correct answer any questions yes any? yes i want to ask something yes you can yeah on number one i'm not sure if my question i will put it the way you would understand it i understand that we we made it as mutually exclusive because of. Um, was there another way beside reasoning by calculation to prove it as this fall under same category? That's what I was wondering. Uh, T and spot. Let's let's get let's get there. C and C and S S can they happen at the same time in terms of the information given? Can a person be a celebrity and be also a superstar? No. So that will create what type of an event? It's an impossible event, right? Yes. Yes. And, and an impossible event has a probability of Of zero. Of zero. And we know that a, a mutually exclusive event is an impossible event, right? Yes. And that is why C and S, the probability of them happening at the same time will be equals to zero, which is mutually exclusive. Okay. Now, I understand it from the reasoning point of view. It just I was struggling whether if like you get such a question whereby they're in the same category, is it possible to make to prove it under calculation or is it by only reasoning? Even if you want to prove it by a calculation, which value are you going to use? Because you need, for example, SM and C have a joint event of 1,800. Where are you going to get the joint event for C and SS? Yeah, that's that's what I was and that's what I was wondering because it was a bit tricky to prove. Yes, I didn't I choose it at zero that it's mutually exclusive, but I was wondering if it happens that I get such a question next time. Yeah. Um, so you just need to look at, can I find a value that I can use to calculate? And if there is no value, therefore it means um, the event cannot happen. So the event, if the event doesn't happen, therefore the probability of, you can't even calculate the probability because yes. it's zero. Yes. The event is zero. All right. All right. Okay. Some of the questions might look like this, where you are given a contingency table, but it's not filled in. So what we need to do is, before we can even answer the questions, we need to complete the entire table. So let's complete the entire table, and then we will look at what the question is asking us. So this is students that were surveyed on a question regarding the means of transport to get to school. And the following table gives their summary of the results. 
So we have males and females and bus, train and own a car. So how many drives or how many uses a bus? There 50. 50. 50. Train? 50. 50. Own a, own a car? 60. A hundred. Hundred. <laughs> hundred. And how many are male? Ninety-five. Ninety-five. How many there are female? One hundred and five. Hundred and five, and what is the total? The grand total? Two hundred. It's two hundred. So now we completed the table. Happy. We can now answer the question. We're going to evaluate each and every statement, right? Which one of the following statement is incorrect? The probability of F and B, which is the probability of female and bus. So this is the joint event. So we need to find observation satisfying divide by N. So how many event are female and bus? 20. There is 20 of them. Divide by the grand total, which is 200. So 20 divided by 200 is 0.1. It's 0.1. So that is correct. 25% of students uses bus to get to school. So yeah, they want to know what is the probability of a bus. And we can multiply the answer by 100 so that we convert the answer to a percentage. So that will be observation satisfying divided by Grand total. How many uses a bus? 50. Regardless of whether they are female or male, so they are 50 divided by 200, Two. and we can multiply that by 100 so that we get it to a percentage. And what is the answer? Is 25%. It's a 25%, 25%, so therefore, that is correct. Event M and F are mutually exclusive. True. That is correct because male and female cannot be happen both. at the same time. So that is correct. The probability of F O O F O O is 0 0.735. So we know that the probability of F O O can be given by the probability of F. Remember, we have the probability of A O B, or we can write it as the probability of A union B, which means one and the same thing. It's given by the probability of A plus the probability of B minus the probability of A and B. Now, instead of writing A and B, we're going to use the letters that we are given, O and F. The probability of F plus the probability of O minus the probability of F and O. So what is the probability of F? Regardless of what type of mode of transport, that will be 105 divided by 200. Remember, is the simple event, which is X divided by N. Probability of A always going to be X divided by N. The probability of A and B will always be X divided by N for joint event on a contingency table. So 
the probability of O? A hundred. It will be 100 over 200. 200 minus the joint event F and O. How many ev events satisfies F 59. and O? 59. So that will be 59 over 200. So you can say 105 plus 100 minus 59 divided by 200. What do you get? Not point seven three. That will be not point seven three, which then it means this is correct. If a student is randomly selected, the probability that a student is a male, given that he uses a tray. So now we need to calculate the probability of a given. Right, I'm gonna use this space here. So we need to find the probability of a male given that they are using a train, a train is T, given that T. Therefore, we need to calculate the probability of male and train divided by the probability of train. Probability of male and train. Male and train, which is the joint, is 24 divided by 200 divided by the probability of train, which is 50 divided by 200. So same, if we convert this, it will be 24 Divide by 200, change the sign to a multiplication, flip, we're going to get 200 over 50, and 200 and 200 cancels out. That gives us 1, and this gives us 1. 24 times 50, 24 times 1 is 24, divide by 50. It's 0 0.48. It is 0 0.48, which means this is incorrect because the answer is 0 0.48. And that's how you answer the questions. So let's look at more questions. Which one of the following statement is incorrect? With regards to experiments using counting rules and assigning probabilities. The number of permutations for four items that can be selected from six items is, so they already told you they, that you need to use permutation. So what do we know about permutation? The formula is NPR. So always remember, the bigger number is your N, the smaller number is your R four items, which is your R, six items, which is your N. So here you will say six P three, uh, four, why am I using three, which is four. Or you and can use three. N factorial, N minus X factorial. So depending on whichever one you want to use. And the answer is? 360. It's 360. So you can use the this one as well. 6 factorial divide by 6 minus 3 factorial. And it should also give you 360. The number of combinations also here they give you what you need to be using of five items that can be selected from a group of nine. So we have five and nine. 
So we need to use NCR, which is N factorial divided by X factorial N minus X factorial. Or you can use, it's nine, right? Nine C five on your calculators by pressing nine and then pressing shift or second function and button number, whatever the, is it the division or is it on number five? Uh, and then press five and then press equal. What is the answer? 126. 126, 126. And in terms of this, you will say nine factorial divided by Five factorial times nine minus five factorial, and it should also give you one twenty-six. An experiment with four steps and five outcomes possible for each step has six hundred and twenty-five outcomes. And that is a power, right? So you will use K N. Remember, your outcomes are K. K is your outcome. N is your four steps. So that will be five to the power of Oh. Which is 625. Which should be equals to 625. Remember, your K is your outcome. Is the outcomes of a sample space. Okay. Uh, number four. In an experiment with 16 likely outcome each experimental outcome has a probability of In an experiment with 16 likely outcome, and each experiment will have the probability of, so yeah, if I'm gonna use an outcome and I'm gonna assume that my outcome, my outcome is A, and it should be the number satisfying divided by the sample space, each experimental outcome, so one of them out of 16, what will be my probability? Not point not six. Not point not six and not not point one six. A classical method of assigning probabilities is approx appropriate when all experimental outcomes are equally likely to happen. And this is just an explanation of a empirical probability or an empirical event. And that is correct. Because remember, the, um, 
if I have a sample space, all of them have to have a likelihood of being selected because like if I toss a coin, it might land on a head or it might land on a tail unless I'm tossing an unfair coin, which maybe it's a square coin. I don't know. Um, but if it's a fair coin, all events or all outcomes have an equal chance of coming up when they are being uh, when an event is created as well. OK, so that will be how you answer the questions relating to probabilities. So sometimes the question will look like this. You want to have a contingency table. If the probability of A is equals to 0 0.4, the probability of B complement, the probability of B complement is 0 0.3, and the probability of A and B is 0 0.2. Which one of the following statement is incorrect? So this is different to that because this is the probability of A and this is the probability of A and B, uh, A complement and B complement. This is also different, so there are two different. This is not the opposite of that, right? A and B is not a complement of A complement, B complement. They are different. So what I will suggest you do before you answer this question, you can draw for yourself a contingency table. And on that contingency table, so there will be four lines, I guess. You can have A here and A complement here. And have B here and have B complement there and there you will have your total and they will be your total. Like I said, you can take the information given and create your own contingency table. So let's do that. We know that the probability of A is 0 0.4. And we know these are probabilities already. So I know that this is equals to one. The probability of A, it's in the total, is 0 0.4. The probability of B complement is 0, 0,3, which will be here, 0, 0,3. The probability of A and B is 0, 0,2. A and B are there, so it's here, 0, 0,2. Complete the entire table. I'm going to give you two minutes to do that. I will be back. Okay, are we done completing the table? Yes, yes. Okay, give me the numbers. So this will be? Not comma seven. Not comma seven, and here will be? Not comma six. Not comma six, and this will be? Not comma two. Not comma two, and yeah. Not comma one. Not comma one. Not comma five. Not comma five. Because if I add this, it should give me zero point four. If I add this, it must give me zero comma seven. Now I've completed the whole table. 
I can just come here and evaluate because I will just refer to all these values that I see here. So number one, the probability of A complement and B complement. Is no point one. It's not point 0.1, so this is the incorrect one because this should be not point 0.1. The probability of B and A complement. B and A complement is not point 0.5. And that is correct. The probability of B regardless of A's. No point 0.7. No point 0.7. The probability of A given B that we need to that we need to calculate because then we need to find the probability of A and the probability of B divided by the probability of B. The probability of A and B is 0.2 divided by because these are probability already, so we don't have to divide by the grand total. So the probability of B is not 0.7. And the answer? 0 0.285. That will be the correct one. And the probability of A or B complement is given by the probability of A plus the probability of B complement minus the probability of A and B complement. So we did calculate the probability of A. No, we didn't. So the probability of A is 0 0.4. The probability of B complement is 0 0.3. And the probability of A and B complement is 0 0.2. And the answer is 0 0.4 plus 0 0.3 is 0 0.7 minus 0 0.2 is 0 0.5. And that will be correct. And that's how you will evaluate the questions. You see, a contingency table helps with visualizing the probabilities given or events given, and then you can answer the questions easier. Let's use the eight minutes to look at some of the questions. So this is one of those questions, and they are telling you here in the beginning, assume that event A and B are mutually exclusive, and if they tell you that, automatically some way you should know that if they tell me that, then it means the event A and B are equals to zero. So they have given it to you. And they also give you that the probability of A is 0 0.3 and the probability of B complement is 0 0.5. So now, if you have all that information given in the beginning, then it complicates most of these things, but not. You can also do the same, draw up a contingency table because now you have all the other information. Come on. So you have A and A complement B and B complement. And here we write totals and total. And we know that this should be equals to 1. Probability of A is 0 0.3. The probability of A and B, they told us, A and B, which is here, they said they are mutually exclusive, so that should be 0. Therefore, it means this probability here is 0 0.3. And here it will be 0 0.7. And what else? We are given the probability of B complement, which is here, yeah, which is 0 0.5. Then this will be 0 0.2, and this will be 0 0.5, and therefore this will be 0 
easy. Can you see that? Easy to complete this. And then once you have a contingency table, easy to answer any of these questions. Which one of the following statement is incorrect? So we are told that the probability of A complement and B complement is equals to zero. Is that true? It's false. That is incorrect. The probability of A and B is equals to zero. That's what they told us. They are mutually exclusive and we can see from here it is correct. And here you just calculate the probability of A plus the probability of B. You don't need because this is equals to zero, so that it will be how you write your answer. The probability of A is 0 0.3. The probability of B is 0 0.5. And that should give you 0 0.8. And that's how you evaluate. The next one. The probability of B given A, you need to know that that is given by the probability of A and B divided by the probability of B. And since the probability of A and B is zero, that will be equals to zero as well. Because they are not independent, but they are mutually exclusive and you cannot divide a value by zero. So you cannot divide zero by any number. It will be equals to zero. And that will be correct. Oh, actually I wrote it all wrong because this should be the probability of a joint event divided by A because it's B given A, but it's still the same because it's the joint event of A and B divided by the given. So it's still going to remain the same. It will be zero because probability of a joint event is zero. Then the probability of A and B complement. A and B complement is 0 0.3 because that is the block. And that's how you will answer the question. It's easy, right? You just need to go and practice and practice. And on that note, we have four minutes. You can also it looks like it it looks like the same question, but they are different. Yeah, they're telling us event A and B are independent. So now when they are independent, what do we know? We know that if we if they are independent, there are several things that we need to consider. The probability of A given B will be equals to the probability of A and the probability of B given A will be the same as the probability of B. That is one of the things that you need to consider when you are answering this. So, similar. You can complete the contingency table. I think I am drawing it too big. Let's draw it too small. So we know that we have A and A complement and B and B complement. We are given the probability of A, which is 0, 0,3. We are given the probability of B complement, which is 0, 0,5. And we know this is 1, and we know this is 0, 0,7. And we know that this is 0, 0,5. But we don't know anything in between. We cannot do anything unless we do the following. What else do we know about independent events? We know if we have this scenario, we can find, because they told us that they are independent. So we know that if we need to find the probability of A and B, we can use either one of them. The probability of A 
times the probability of B. Remember conditional probability, probability of A given B is given by the probability of A and B divided by the probability of B. So if I multiply that will be the probability of A given B times the probability of B is equals to the probability of A and B. Now, I know in terms of independence, that is the case. So therefore it means this probability of A times the probability of B is equals to the probability of A and B. And if I know that, then I can find the probability of A and B. So let's find the probability of A and B. We know what the probability of A is, is 0 0.3. We know what the probability of B is, is 0 0.5. So calculate that. 0 0.3 times 0 0.5. 0 0.15. It's 0 0.15, right? 0 0.15. So that is the joint probability, then 0 0.15. We can write it there. What is the probability of B and A complement in this? 0 0.5 minus 0 0.15? 0 0.35. 0 0.35 and you can also do the same. This will be 0 0.35, right? Because it should give me 70, 0, 70 percent. 0 0.35 plus 0 0.35 will give me 0 0.7. So this will be 0 0.15, 0 0.15. Now I have all the information you can come and answer the question it is your homework i have done enough you can also go and look at this you can also answer same questions so here you need to evaluate if they are independent you know when they are independent you it's the same if they are independent it means the conditional probabilities of a given b should be equals to a so you can prove that uh, you can prove that, that B given C are independent by using, by proving that the probability of B given C should be the same as the probability of B, or you can do the probability of C given B. You just need to do one of them. Should be the same as the probability of C if it's independent. You also need to prove whether A and B are mutually exclusive. They told you that, that A and B are that. So are they equals to zero? If they are equals to zero, A and B should be equals to zero under the mutually exclusive event. Impossible event, it means A and C, the probability of A and C should also be equals to zero. Can you prove that? If you are able to prove it, then there will be impossible event. Event A and B are dependent. Dependent, it means they are not equal, so you can use the same. The probability of A given B should not be equal to the probability of B or the probability of B given A should not be equal to the probability of B. Uh, I wrote the first one wrong. It should say the probability of A. So if you can prove that that is the case, then they are dependent. A and B are independent. You do the same, but they need to be equal. You, you do the same statement, but they will have to be equal because if they are independent, then then now you need to choose which one is the correct one by choosing any of this symbol. That's how complex it is with multiple choice question. You work three times as much as if you were writing a question where you write answers only. Also, this is how they can also ask you questions. You don't also not only have to know the calculations. You need to know 
the theory behind every calculation. That is why it's very important that you understand the content as well. So I've given you lots and lots of work to do. If there are things that you are not sure about, we can have a discussion on the WhatsApp group. Remember, you cannot post the question without showing us how you worked it out. Here is another example. I'm not going to even give you some hint now. I've given you enough. Here is another example where you need to calculate the probability of A and B. Here is another example. You need to complete the table and then answer the question. They are asking, pay attention to the weights given. It means you will need to calculate the probability of something given. And the given will be that. So given will be the neuro NP. And here they're asking if it's a boy, so it's B given P. And then you just need to use the formula to calculate. Remember, these are events, not probabilities, so you will have to divide by the grand total. This is another way that they can ask you questions in a statement format. If you are stuck, let me know how I can unstuck you. This is another way. I've given you a lot of questions. You can see that you can practice and practice. If there is things that you don't understand, you can ask on the WhatsApp group. And that concludes today's session. Our one hour, 30 minutes. It any questions, any comments before we close off the session? Any final word? Okay, without any comment or questions or final word, then I will just end right here and say thank you for coming through. Uh, just to recap, please remember that you need to understand and learn what the basic probabilities are all about because we're not going to have another session um, on basic probabilities until the last session of a, a, a week before you go submit your second submission. Uh, so go through the work, understand the events, understand how to answer them, and also remember that you need to also understand the theory behind the basic probabilities, not only the formulas and the questions. And as you can see that there are so many formulas that we are using, and I just summarized all the formulas when I was doing the summary. You can also have them somewhere neatly written so that you can always refer to them because you need to know how to calculate the probability of A and B or the joint probabilities or a simple probabilities. You need to know how to calculate the probability of A or B, which is either. And if A and B are mutually exclusive, you need to know that the probability will be zero. You also need to know how to find the conditional probabilities. And in case where you need to use multiplication rule is when you are given the conditional probabilities and you are asked to find the probability of A and B. And if event A and B are independent, therefore it means the conditional probability of A given B will be the same as the probability of A, and you can use that to prove if events are independent or not. And that is what we've learned today. Have a lovely Sunday. Thank you. Have a great Thank Sunday. You, Thank, Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Bye.